Hi everyone, I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas. And I'm very excited that um, we are going to be hosting another event tonight. I'm sorry, this the, my dog has been quiet this whole time and now she's barking. Um, so I'm so excited that we're gonna be hosting another event tonight in um, partnership with Crime Writers of Color. Tonight, we're gonna be focusing on thriller authors and we're gonna be having um, some excellent readings from some of the members of the group. I'm gonna put a link in the comments shortly for more information about Crime Writers of Color as an organization. But um, right now I'm going to put a link in the comments um, if you're interested in reading more about the authors or their books or to order books from Murder by the Book. Um, I've just put that link in the comments. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I wanna mention every year, uh, this time of year, we take part in a book drive um, with the uh, Evelyn Swarzynski Foundation. So, um, beloved crime writer, Dwayne Swarzynski lost his daughter a few years ago, and um, they set up a, a book drive through the Children's Hospital in LA, their uh, literary healing program. Um, so you can find out more information about it at teamevfoundation.com. I'll also put that link in the comments, but um, we take care of making sure the books get delivered. Um, the, the book drive continues through December 5th. Um, we, if you're local to Houston, you can bring in books from anywhere. They don't have to be um, purchased at Murder by the Book, but they do need to be new uh, books, not used because many of the children have compromised immune systems. Every single book that you purchase um, for the book drive enters you into a drawing for Murder by the Book, a $100 Murder by the Book gift card. And if you do decide that you wanna order books online and take part in this, um, we just ask that you select in-store shipping um, so that, or in-store pickup because we gather the books and we mail them all to LA. Um, and that you also place the book drive orders separate from other book drive orders, or uh, excuse me, separate from other orders. So book drive orders on their own. Um, <clears throat> I guess that's it. If you have any uh, questions tonight, we're gonna try to field um, questions as they come up, possibly. Um, if we don't get to your question, it's because um, the logistics on having a multi-author reading are a little more uh, difficult than normal. But I guess that's I guess that's it out of me tonight. Thanks for being here. It's gonna be a great evening um, of readings. We have Ed Amar, Cheryl Head, Yasmin Ango, Naomi Hirohara, Rachel Hazel Hall, and Sylvia Moreno Garcia as our readers and our MCs for the night are gonna be Alex Segura and Kelly Garrett, who I will bring on right now. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good to see you guys. I'm so glad Hi. that we're doing this series now. It's super fun and um, I'm thrilled that we're partnered with it. I'm gonna go away and let you guys uh, take over. Thank so you for having you. us. We were yes, like, thank um, you. We had so much fun the last time. So we're so excited that we get to do this every couple months now. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Okay, I'm gonna go behind the scenes and uh, get ready to move people on and on throughout the night. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. See you soon. It's finally, right. we're in charge. Well, Here we we're are. Kind of we're kind of, she's still in charge a little bit, but. She could boot us at any moment. Any moment. How's it going? It's good. How are you doing today? I haven't nice. talked to you at all today. We should talk all day. And I, haven't talked I know. To you yeah. I haven't, I haven't heard for, it's been a busy day, I guess, for everybody. Guess, yes. It's yeah. Really whatever. Whatever. How dare they keep us apart. So why are we doing this thing? Um, <laughs> I guess I should give a little background on how this came to be, right? Also, tell them who you are. For people yes, who don't yes, know. that's true. I'm Alex Segura. I am a crime writer, and my new book, Secret Identity, is coming out in March from Flatiron Books. It's a noir. Oh, wow, nice. <laughs> I'll your book is on your book is on my nightstand. Uh, it's yeah, a, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a noir novel set in 1975 New York, and it follows uh, Carmen Valdez, who's a uh, her dream is to write comics and to work in comics, and she gets a job as a secretary at this fictional company called Triumph Books, and she is not given any opportunity to write. And she has to basically anonymous anonymously co-create this character called the Legendary Links. But when her collaborator is murdered, she has to basically put on the amateur PI hat and solve his murder to reclaim her character. And there's actual comic book pages in uh, in the book. So I'm really, cool. really excited for people to read it. Uh, you got to read it already. So thank you for that. I did. I did. I did. I had to beg and plead, but I got to read it. So thank you. <laughs> I got to read yours. My wife read yeah. yours, too. I know. I love her. She's my favorite. Sarah. Yeah. Big fan. Um, yeah. Mine so too. You, you guys, I tried to be fancy and like get my book cover on a frame and hang it up and it fell down. So 
Oh, I was wondering about that unique framing <laughs> setup. <laughs> unique, it's called yeah. it fell. Um, so sorry that you it fell, but it's gonna just to stay there. Um, so I'm Kelly Garrett. I'm one of the co-founders of Prime Writers of Color. I'm also an author. Um, my next book is called Like a Sister. It comes out in March. It's like, it comes out a week before Alex's book comes out. Um, it's great. Thank you. It's the story of Lena Scott, who wakes up one day to a headline that her half sister, um, who's a former reality star, has been found dead in, of a heroin overdose um, in the Bronx, which is a few blocks away from Lena's house. And the two of them haven't really spoken in two years. So Lena has no clue what's going on with her sister, Desiree. But she does know that there's no way that Desiree would, one, ever go to the Bronx and two, ever um, use heroin. And so she's trying to find out what happens, and she's soon kind of plunged into De Desiree's glamorous world as she tries to answer these two questions of why was Desiree coming to see her and why didn't she make it? Um, so it's a really, it's a standalone for me, which is different than my other two books. It's still fun, though. Um, and it's actually, twisty, Lori, twisty and fun. Twisty and my, my, my editor claims it's voicey. Um, mm -hmm. I, trust, I trust my editor. And so Lori Raider Day calls it um, domestic suspense for the Instagram generation. I thought that was such a great way to describe it. So yeah. I'm super excited about it. Um, now that we've plugged ourselves, let's kind of talk <laughs> about, let's talk about this event. What is this event, Alex? Yeah, so this started, I think we were planning a Crime Writers of Color reception for BoucherCon yeah. in New Orleans. And obviously that didn't happen. You know, um, we just weren't able to have the event because of, you know, very good reasons, this crazy pandemic, but um, Murder by the Book was kind enough to host the you reception. Yes, thank you mm -hmm. so much for hosting the event. Um, so we did it virtually, it went over really well. And um, I think almost immediately we, we asked and we were talking and decided let's make it a regular thing. So yeah, every couple months we will hopefully spotlight some of our members and uh, we'll try to group it by genre or, you know, style of book or whatever works for us. But um. Today we're going to be doing edge of uh, edge of your seat thrillers, and uh, we've got a pretty amazing lineup. So I, I think we do. Um, and if you guys don't know what Crime Writers of Color is, um, it's an organization that I started along with Walter Mosley and Gigi Pondian um, about a couple years ago, and it started off with about thirty people. And now we have over three hundred members, and they're from all. Um, all like areas of their career people like walter mosley two people who are like i think i want to write a, a crime novel one day <laughs> um and so it's really cool because it started off just as like a group um a, on a listserv and now we have a website which is crimewritersofcolor.com um, which has a books page and events page and also a speakers directory so if you're looking for really great books to read we got you events to go to we got you um people to come talk to y'all's libraries or bookstores whatever we got you with that um we also have a column when King's River's Life uh, magazine that Liz Wilkerson does. Um, we're also on social media, which is at Crime WOC. We're on Instagram, thanks to Alexia Gordon. We're on Facebook, thanks to Quincy Drinker. And we're on uh, Twitter, thanks to Nikki Dolson and Sarah Chen. So that's where, where you can find us. So now that we've plugged the organization, should we get And there's started? a podcast. We have a podcast. Oh, my God. How did I forget the podcast? <laughs> that's like the coolest thing. Robert Justice, who did our website, also does a really amazing podcast where he does a very deep dive one-on-one. -on -one with an author from our group and he's pretty much he's done me he's on walter he's on Gigi, he's on alex i know he's on rachel and he reads um, the book which is awesome yeah so like he like actually <laughs> reads the book and really thinks of like really yeah. good questions so if you haven't checked it ch checked it checked it out um you can find it on our website and also we're on like spotify and all the major um platforms as well so, yeah definitely subscribe to that just to uh to kind of widen your tbr pile there he spotlights yeah. every month he spotlights a great author also, we're, there's a, like a chat with all the authors are talking about what they're eating for dinner. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had yeah, just, yeah, it looks good. It does sound yummy. <laughs> Leftover ceviche. Um, yeah, so we have a pretty amazing lineup. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of wow that we were able to gather so many greats to read. And uh, we'll be chatting with each of them and just hearing about what's coming up for them. And then uh, we'll get to sit back and listen to some really great crime fiction. So yeah. should we get started? Let's do it. Well, I mean, it's yeah. Ed, I guess we can start. Yeah, I guess we'll start with Ed. <laughs> Ed Amar. Hi, Ed. Hey, Alex, Kelly, how are you? How are you? I'm good, Ed. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Um, thank you so much for putting this event on. And thanks to Murder by the Book for hosting it. I'm just um, glad I'm not the only one with air traffic control headphones. 
<laughs> this is my second job. I'm actually at a drive-through right now. Oh, good. Yeah. So well, yeah. That's good. Yeah. I'm just gonna be, be leaning burger? over to give like cokes to people <laughs> and, and burgers. So it's really and, the food chat that's doing this. And where's your dog at? That's what we really are, are here for. Is the dog? We saw him yeah, earlier. I know. I know. Everybody wants to see the dog. So okay, what? here he is. I don't know why I'm actually grunting because he's only two. He guys. seems pretty light. <laughs> Oh, yeah. very cute. Hey, Mojo, say hi. He was asleep, so see, isn't he tiny? Oh, he is tiny. Yeah, yeah he's very tiny. Yeah, I he's a he really French. He's eight weeks old. Oh, he's very cute. He's already famous. Is he going to read for you, or he is? Oh, yeah, good. I'm just going to yeah. put these headphones on his gigantic ears. <laughs> he's a, uh, he's a genius. He's yeah. got like a why is this happening look on his face. He's gonna do a triumph the insult comic doll kind of thing, just chew on a cigar in the corner and oh he's so small. Huh? He's so tiny. I know, I know. It's weird. He's two pounds, he's gonna get to like twenty-five. Okay. Well we'll have to come back in a year or two so we can see how he's doing. Yeah, oh, and he's asleep. All right, that was fast. Okay. That's cute. Just what like are you me. gonna read? What are you gonna read, Ed? So I'm going to read the, uh, I haven't, this is from my news book and it it is called No Home for Killers. It's about a troubled and abusive jazz musician who's murdered and his two sisters, his two estranged sisters, uh, one a former, former social worker, the other a secret vigilante are pulled in, are reluctantly brought together to uh, find out what really happened to him. It is very good. Oh, so this is this is um, a you. sneak peek. We guys, this is like a sneak peek. Yeah, of some there is. Gonna be this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the uh, second chapter in it. All right. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna meet myself. Yes. Good idea. I, we're not gonna talk more. We're done. I should. Okay. I'll just. I'll just read then. Okay. <laughs> oh Jesus! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! At the kidnap man kicking inside the trunk of her car, mercifully. John Winters, the kidnapped man, quieted down. Emily sighed and yawned and reached over to the glove compartment. She popped it open, fumbled past a plastic case filled with syringes, pulled out an energy drink, unscrewed the top, downed it, tossed the empty canister into the back seat with the others as she drove down the interstate. Caffeine filled her, tingled her nerves, evaporated her exhaustion. Emily had barely slept this week, and that pissed her off because she loved sleeping. She was always tired. Probably, she reflected, because of all the fighting. But it hadn't been fighting this week that had kept her up. It was Marcus's death. They hadn't been close. There was always distance between them. Marcus was single-mindedly attached to his music, and Emily could give a shit about jazz. But there were moments, as the oldest and youngest siblings, when Emily and Marcus enjoyed camaraderie, a playful rebellion against dutiful Melinda or their strict parents, laughing at their parents' demands while Melinda urged them to listen, getting drunk while Melinda resolutely stayed sober. And then everything split apart at their mother's funeral five years ago. The family sent flying in different directions. No one had returned. Emily glanced in the rearview mirror. There was no good place to pull over on Interstate 66, the long road leading straight from Virginia to D.C. No place where privacy was promised, which meant she had to work quickly. Time to put John Winters back to sleep. Emily slowed the car, pulled over to the side, left her emergency blankers off just in case someone saw her car and decided to help. She grabbed her mask, the canvas brown mask with three vertical black stripes painted down the front, pulled it over her head and tucked her dyed blonde hair inside. Emily reopened the glove compartment, took out a syringe filled with midazolam. Emily glanced in the rearview mirror again, saw a break in oncoming cars, crawled into the back seat. She kept her head down as she popped a latch, pulled the seat down to reveal the inside of the trunk, heard a whimper, smelled frightened piss. She positioned her thumb over the syringe's plunger. No light from inside. Emily had taken out the trunk's bulb, disabled the emergency latch, removed everything else. Nothing was in her trunk except John Winters, his mouth gagged and wrist bound. His eyes widened when passing headlights illuminated her mask. He cried against the gag, tried to jerk his body free from the restraints. Emily ignored him, squinted at the syringe, pressed the needle against his bicep. The back of Emily's head smacked into the driver's seat. His kick had come out of nowhere, Left Emily's world lopsided. Brief nausea quickly rose, disappeared. Oh, Emily thought, his feet. Forgot to tie his feet. Another kick to her chest pushed her into the front seats. Emily shook her head and sat up, trying to see clearly. John Winters was still in the car, his bound hand scrabbling at the back door, looking for the handle. Rude, Emily said. She reached to him. 
He opened the door and spilled outside. John Winters was fortunate he'd opened the door leading to the woods and not the side to traffic, especially since the semi chose that moment to barrel past her car, so close that the Civic shook. Emily saw John race into the woods lining the interstate, disappear into trees. She pulled herself together, climbed out of the car, took a second to think, then followed him into the woods. She'd planned to question him. Might as well do it here. It was dark, but Emily could hear him rushing through trees and bushes. John ran quickly, even with his hands bound. She wasn't surprised. Emily knew he was athletic, had watched him through binoculars in his apartment for a week, seen him sweating through an impressive cardio routine, and she noticed his confidence with men who visited him, visited him ominous men who barely spoke, men used to intimidating others, men who, when they passed her on their way into his building while she loitered and chatted on her phone, stared her down like they were daring her to remember them. Emily remembered them. She made sure of it. As soon as they entered the building, she stopped pretending to talk and typed their descriptions into her phone. She wanted information about every spider in this web of criminals and how they could be connected to her brother's death. The forest thinned the deeper they ran, the ground uneven. Still, Emily ran easily, effortlessly. Didn't feel like she was running as much as bounding, a deer lightly touching the ground and springing away, running toward the fight further from the highway and civilization. John Winters abruptly turned and swung his bound fist into the side of her head. Emily stepped backward, face stinging, mask crooked, blinded. She pulled the mask straight, winced as her hands ran over her cheek. Pulled out her baton, pressed a button. The steel baton extended two feet. John Winters stood in front of her, breathing hard. He roughly yanked the ball gag off his face, threw it into the dark. Emily spun the baton, keeping it moving. Say friend to my little hello, she said. Wait, that's that's not right. Who the hell are you, John asked. What's with the mask? Your family killed Marcus Pena. What? His face turned ugly. He lifted his fists. Emily felt that stone sensation inside her, a feeling with which she was familiar, that grim gray resolve, the chirpiness in her voice and mind, the lightness of her personality turned distant, almost as if Emily had been watching herself on television, inches from the screen, but now she heard it sound from another room. All that existed was John, weaving in front of her. Emily lunged and lashed his right knee with the baton, restrained herself from hitting too hard. She knew from experience that force would turn his kneecap into a jigsaw puzzle, send him into shock, and she needed him to answer her questions. John Winters winced, reached for her with his bound hands, clumsily stepped toward her. Emily ducked out of the way and slammed her baton into his spine. John shouted, fell to the ground, his body lunged up like an inchworm, but he couldn't rise. Your family killed Marcus Pena, Emily said again. John didn't respond, just rise, groaned. Oh, awesome, Emily exclaimed, and she raised her baton over John Winter's broken body. She hadn't expected a confession, knew they didn't come easy. Let's do this the hard way. That's it. Awesome. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, You'll guys. have to settle for our awkward clapping in lieu of a real audience. <laughs> my, my clapping's not awkward. Speak for yourself. Mine was like very pitter-patter. It was very pitter-patter, <laughs> but I was okay with that. I, I love how you uh, picked the scene that was action-packed and still very uh, you know evocative of the whole book. So good work. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was originally going to read the acknowledgments. Yeah, I thought that would yeah. be kind of, you know. It's a good way to kind of ease people into uh, our world. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much. And thank again, honestly, thank you so much for for hosting this event. I, I've done a lot of these, and I know uh, hosted a lot of these, and I know it's not uh, easy. And uh, and I appreciate uh, the effort you two uh, did for this. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, going first. I know it's a thankless spot, but you you oh, well, did it with with ease. Yes. Um, yeah. People want to know what's the title again, and when is it out? Oh, so it's no, it's called No Home for Killers, and it is right now uh, on submission. So if you're an editor out there who has it, hit me up, and I, the money, though. I'm the not money. going to, yeah, Show I don't buy people. Money. <laughs> if, you, if you publish this book, you can play with this dog as much as you want. Provide oh, kibble God. for this dog, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah things got awkward. Okay. Um... <laughs> um. We asked everyone to, to uh, suggest a book title by a fellow crime writer of color. So what is your suggestion for us? Okay, so you guys have already had me at this event. So this isn't uh, sucking up whatsoever. I can be brutally honest. Um, <laughs> I want to read your books. 
I have them both. And You're going to read as if you have not. I have not. I want to. They're on my... Well, somebody talked me into doing Pitch Wars, which I ended up Whatever. loving, and now I'm reading full <laughs> manuscript. Changing your life. Changing your um, life. <laughs> and, no, my TBR pile is, like, three books deep right now before I can get to both of yours, but I am <laughs> really excited. That's the, uh, the best part. I did give him warning. He still did not figure out a title. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm sorry. Those were the those were my thoughts. I, I really uh, I'm excited about it. I have Alex's and your... wait, what's my title's what's the title of my book, Ed? Huh? What's the title of my book? Like a <laughs> like a title, <laughs> like oh, like a like, cousin. I like knew a cousin. It. Yeah, yeah. Public Great. identity is mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god they're never gonna have us back so thank you ed for thanks ed that was amazing it was a great it was a great reading i'll give you yes that. <laughs> all right and next up we uh we have cheryl head next the cheryl head. the one and only cheryl how are you i'm good i don't have a dog i'm sorry damn okay. <laughs> we didn't get the memo we have to have a dog to be a part of run down and get a dog <laughs> how's your day going <laughs> Oh, uh, pretty good. Not a not a bad day. I was in Florida yesterday, and I'm DC today, so it's you know, comparatively wow. speaking, it's okay. What, yeah. What were, what were you doing in Florida? My mom turned 94 yesterday. Oh, wow. happy birthday! And she's it's a amazing. Libra. Yeah. Libra's a fast. Libra season. Yeah, Libra season. yeah. Libra season exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real thing. It's a real thing for a month. <laughs> As it should be. Hello. <laughs> My birthday was Monday, guys. So that's why I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Happy belated. I love Libra. Happy belated. So, what so are, are you going to Cheryl? I'm going to read from uh, my latest, the sixth yes. book, and Charlie Mack warned me when it's time. And uh, short reading uh, is the very beginning of the book. And I can jump right in if you want. Please do. Do you want to set up the series at all? or? Um, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> Catch up, y'all. Y'all better catch up. Every yeah. book is a standalone. You don't have to read the first to get into. The New York Times called this one chilling and prescient. How about that? It is. It is. <laughs> okay. This is the prologue. Dearborn, Michigan, 2009. Shit, Robbie said, stumbling on the stairs. Can't we turn on the goddamn lights? Of course not, you idiot. You want somebody to see us? There's nobody here. The old man left. I told you that. Let's just do the job and get the hell out of here. Give me the wire and the detonator. Frank hated working with the young guys. They asked too many questions, made too much noise, and required too many attaboys at the end of the job. You do the paint in that room over there, Frank said, pointing. That's where they pray. You sure you know what the hell you're doing with that stuff, Frank? Are we going to talk about this again? I'm not a newbie. I've done this before. Robbie watched Frank lift the spool of wire in one hand and a canvas bag in the other and trudge up the hallway, breathing heavily. He could smell Frank's body odor. What he disliked most about this group is they all acted like cowboys. They called themselves the White Turks, but they were mostly a bunch of soft, middle-aged guys with bones to pick about keeping their guns and their stupid flags. 20 minutes later, the two exited the mosque from the side door, hugging the shadows of the building until they reached the front entrance and stopped. They listened for shouts, alarms, or barking dogs, then split up as planned. Frank headed to the van in the strip mall a block away, and Robbie moved to the bus shelter where his bike was locked to the signpost. Riding a bike kept him in shape. It was also his opinion a guy on a bike drew little or no attention. As he pedaled past the mosque, he glanced back at the square facade. A lot of the homes in this neighborhood were owned by the Asians and even a few Mexicans who made their money working construction. Recently, Muslims had overrun the neighborhood. He wondered how the white residents could stand those loudspeakers blaring each day. Shit, why can't they just use bells and pray on Sunday like everybody else? Last week, Robbie had posted in his private online group how happy he was with this initiation assignment. If we put a scare into these people, maybe they'll stop. Maybe they'll think twice before coming to our country to take our jobs. I'm tired of competing with all these browns and blacks just to get an entry level position. If you come to this country, try and be an American. And if you can't do that, get the hell out. He'd gotten over 100 likes for that post. Robbie laughed out loud, thinking about tonight's tagging job. I gave them some good old English words to stare at while they're down on their knees. To hell with them and their weird looking language. He steered his bike onto Ford Road, staying in the curb lane for his 40 minute ride. It would be a decent workout, especially if he did some sprints. When he got home, he'd do some online study. These soft guys just drink beer and do a whole lot of talking. They don't study. 
how are you gonna beat back the tide of illegals and mongrels if you don't put in the work? Hassan Pasha had just reached his freeway exit when the security monitoring company called to report a silent alarm. It was the third time this month. I bet I forgot to close the inner door again. It took him 35 minutes to get back to the mosque and he pulled his car up to the side door and left it running. He stopped short at the side of the side door standing ajar. He stepped inside, flipped on the light and paused. He heard no noise. He moved along the marble floor, passing the office and several classrooms, including the one he'd been teaching in only 90 minutes before. He'd notice a dim glow in the office, but there was a brilliant light coming from the prayer room. It created a triangle on the floor at the end of the hallway. Something's wrong. He pulled out his mobile phone and pushed the number that connected him to the alarm company. This is Mr. Pasha. I've returned to the building. It looks like maybe there's been a break in. Are you okay? The female voice at the security call center asked. Yes, I'm fine. Has anything been taken? Is there any damage? She asked. Hold on a minute, I'll see. Hold on, Mr. Pasha, do you wanna wait until the police arrive? No, no, I'll be okay. Everything's quiet. I wanna take a look around. Hassan stood in the center of the prayer room. Whoever applied the thick black paint on the walls and Mirab wasn't a great speller and maybe in fact have been dys dyslexic. He had, seen this, he had seen this kind of vulgar language before, painted on the exterior walls and once on a couple of cars in the lot, but this was the first time someone had dared to defile the interior of the masjid. Yes, there is damage. We've had extensive damage, I'm afraid. Please notify the authorities. While he waited for the police to arrive, Hassan checked the other common areas of the mosque. The ablution area was untouched, but the carpet was streaked with the same shiny black paint defacing the walls. He remembered the light in the office and retraced his steps and peered through the window of the closed door. It seemed to be coming from a washroom in the rear. The police would probably prefer the room remain undisturbed, but the office was where the mosque's audiovisual equipment was stored. If anything was missing, Hassan wanted to know before calling the imam. He touched the doorknob, it turned in his hand. He moved only a single step when he was overwhelmed by a tremendous roar. The force of the explosion propelled him into the hallway wall. His head smashing against the marble wall was abrupt and only momentarily painful. Hassan saw a flash of white light, then everything went black. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you guys, dynamic duo. I like that. We need t-shirts, yeah. Alex. We need t-shirts. We do, um, we do. That was intense, Cheryl. That was really intense. intense. Yeah, it's an intense book. It still it feels timely, even though it takes place, what, 11, 12 years ago? Yeah, I wanted to show kind of what was happening in the nascent beginnings of some of these alt-right groups, and especially in Detroit and southeastern Michigan, because of uh, the kidnapping and murder conspiracy that people were plotting just last year against the governor of Michigan. Yeah. Just kind of appalled by that. Did you have um, to do a lot of research, or? Yeah, I had to do a lot of research, and you know, troubling research too. Yeah, yeah. going into some of their chat rooms was really. You had, I had to walk around for a while, and I felt a little guilty about some of the language I had to use, but I wanted it to be authentic to the the language they would use. So, Cheryl, you have some good news that you need to yes. share with the, with the people. Oh, I have some good news. Yes, I um, have recently- She sounds so excited. <laughs> She's like, I do. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed by it. A, a, a it's deal, amazing. A really, a really wonderful deal to write a story that's really personal to me. Um, um, my great gra my grandfather was murdered by Birmingham police in 1929. And I'm writing a fictionalized uh, version of that murder in a dual timeline where my grandfather talks about his life and his murder in his voice. And in the second narrative, uh, which is contemporary narrative, his great granddaughter, who's an investigative reporter uh, at a newspaper in Detroit is trying to solve his murder. So I'm excited to get the deal. It, it was really a wonderful it's, process. It's, it's, it's called Time's Undoing and it's, it's with called Dutton, Time's right? Undoing and yeah, it won't be out until 2023. So I've got lots of time next year to write. That's like, that's, that's the thing. I think Alex and I were similar where we sold our books like last year and it's, yeah. we're not coming out to next year. So these, this is a two year wait is hard. I'll have yeah. to call you to find out what I could do. Maybe I'll have to get a dog. I, I had to, I mean, I had, I had to finish the book. We, I sent a proposal. Yeah, so, I, I, um. finished, I finished the book and did a bunch of other stuff. 
yeah. I, don't, I don't relax well either. So yeah, it's a I'm hurry up and wait now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, congratulations, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm so, so excited for that. So tell us Appreciate what it. your recommendation is. That is not, besides me oh, and yes, Al. Yes, I'm happy <laughs> to recommend. I almost forgot uh, Jennifer Hillier's Little Streak Secrets. I love it because it starts so strong. It's such punchy, pithy writing. She's got a great writing style. I think it keeps the momentum going. And it's and it takes you on some twists and turns. It's not a typical kind of uh, child loss um, novel. It has some secrets and some twists and turns. I really like. Yeah, she's right. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, good choice. A, thank you, super sweet person. <laughs> yeah, she's thank, great. Cheryl, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, Cheryl. Good to see you too. See you Thanks soon. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye. All right, next up we have uh, Yasmin Ango. Hi. Yes. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? It's going okay. I'm so nervous, y'all. I like Hi. your book placement. I mean, you look, you. you look you look great. Your background yeah. looks great. You have a painting. You have a book. You have some flowers. What? Why are you nervous? I, I'm, I don't know, but it just started as soon as uh, uh, Cheryl was like, "I'm done." I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> <laughs> oh no! You're gonna be great. The book yeah, is fantastic. It is fantastic. We're so excited about the success. Thank you. all <laughs> so what will you be reading today? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to be reading um, just a snippet of um, her name is Night. Oh, she got that there as well. Back. Nice. Yes. Yes. Um, so here we go. All right. Nina swept the room, ensuring there were no more playthings who would pop out at her. Her eyes landed on the array of TV monitors and narrowed, zeroing in on one screen that looked different from all the others. It was black and white. It was a black and white video feed of Juarez in his bedroom, and she could see he wasn't alone. She swallowed visions of what would, could have gone very badly running through her mind. How Network had missed this feed, she had no idea. They'd been lucky. Dispatch is complete. There's a separate feed running, she muttered into her comm device. Look, looks like the Mark's been watching number one's bedroom. We see it was the response she received. This time, it wasn't wit, but some member of the network team she didn't care to know. Leave them. Use the flash drive to burn their system and return home. But what if it's in the cloud? A pause. It's not. They're old school. She didn't register the last part because the screen held her attention hostage, her jaw tightening as she made sense of what she was watching. Through her earpiece, Nina Nina heard the team engaging, more guards clearing the home, readying to return to the van. Each soft grunt, each puke of the silencers, each pat a pat of the semi-automatics. She forced herself to move on her new orders. She found the computer and slipped in the small flash drive network would use to fry the system. Then she hustled, leaving the room to head downstairs. But she paused at the top of the carpeted stairs. Time was winding down, but what she'd seen in the screen made her turn around and run up the next flight instead of down. She had to do one last thing. People thought slavery was long dead, but they only had to look at the recording of the Cuban masters of the Cubans master suite to see that slavery did indeed still exist and right in this very home. It was something of which Nina knew all too well. That was before she became Echo. She recalled the mansion's layout, finding the master suite quickly, ignoring the chatter of her team and network communicating in her ear. She grabbed the doorknob and twisted silently. The door opened on a slight creak, making her pause. She listened in case anyone inside had heard. No one had. Echo, switching to pri private chat, a private channel, Wit said in her ear. A second later, he asked, what are you doing? She grimaced. Wit never went off script during missions, but then again, neither did she. Her straying from the playbook must have worried him enough to break pro protocol. You're off course. Get where you need to be. But Nina was where she needed to be. She pushed the door open wide enough to enter a suite bathed in burgundy and gold, surrounding a massive four-poster bed that would fit six grown men. The room felt bigger than her little home in Citrus Grove, bigger than any room she'd imagined when she was a little girl living in Ghana. This ugly, dark room reminded her of Fifty Shades, but in it was the stuff of nightmares and the Cuban, the boogeyman. The girl Nina saw was nothing more than a waif. It was difficult to tell her ethnicity from behind the veil of long stringy hair, obscuring her face like something out of a horror movie. The straps of the in 
inappropriately adult negligee slid off her young shoulders. She trembled so violently, the massive stain covered bed shuddered beneath her. Her whimpers struck a nerve jarring chord in, in Nina, memories of barbed wire, the hot box, where she'd been kept, and the bodies, so many bodies flashed through her mind and nearly brought her to her knees. His back to where his back was to where Nina stood in the shadows. The Cuban carefully selected a collar with an attached leash, smiling lecherously. He did it as if he were choosing an engagement ring. He lurched toward the girl while shrugging off his robe, revealing he was naked as the day he was born. The girl, now on her knees, whimpered louder. Her eyes were wide and she stared from behind the curtain of hair and whispered, por favor, senor, no. Nina wasn't sure why she was hesitating. She was watching as he fas fastened the choker around the girl's bone neck thin, bone thin neck and clicked the lock. The girl winced and he cinched the collar too tight. Every time he touched her, she jerked as if branded with a white hot poker. Nina holstered her si sidearm and from the sheath strapped to her back, pulled out her blade. Time, Wit warned. You're gonna love it, mommy, the Cuban said. Nina's muscles grew taut as she readied herself. I'm gonna give it to you good. The Cuban slapped the girl hard, so hard Nina felt it sting. He pulled his hand back up behind his head, his fingers curling into a tight fist. It was the girl's high pitched whinny of terror that finally spurred Nina to action. She moved swiftly, ignoring the thick, wiry carpet covering the Cuban's back or how he smelled of body odor and stale cigar smoke. The girl was no longer looking at him. She was staring, open-mouthed at the creature behind him. Nina held her fingers to her lips in silent communique. Ignoring wit, calling time in her ear again, she raised her arm, grasping the Cuban's face and jerking it back against her chin. With her opposite hand, she dragged the blade across his neck separating the soft quivering folds of skin as if he were as if she were cutting through softened butter he gurgled blood bubbling out of the gaping wound his hands flew to his neck in a futile effort to seal his skin back together she released him his body falling with a heavy thud on the floor both women watched as his life spilled out in a growing pool around his body what the bloody hell Wit growled through Nina's earpiece, snapping her back to attention. The team was waiting for her. Nina had deviated from the plan long enough. A rustling from the bed drew Nina's gaze to the girl. She considered carefully what to do with her. Nina couldn't leave, live, leave her like that. She couldn't take her either. The girl's tiny hands picked at the collar around her neck. And without another thought, Nina stepped to the Cuban Bureau of Sex Paraphernalia and the little key dangling on a hook inside of it. She could hear the team checking in with network as they returned to the van. She'd skew the mission time if she was late, possibly compromise the safety of the whole team if more of the Cuban's men survived on site, arrived on site. She had to move. She tugged the key off the hook. The girl would need to figure out how to survive or not on her own. Wit growled, for God's sake, you need to leave now on the way. Nina gave the room one final sweep her eyes pausing briefly at the bed before she slipped through the doorway. Behind her, the girl scrambled toward the little silver key that had landed among the satin sheets and pillows. As Nina raced through the hallways and down the stairs, away from the girl in the bed who reminded Nina of a past she wished she could forget, she felt like she was running right back to the beginning of it all. That's it. That was awesome. so good. Um, that was great. I didn't want to say it before, but this is her first time reading. Yes, you did it great. Is. It is. I'm sorry. So I've made a lot of mistakes. Sorry. Oh, we no. didn't notice them. We didn't notice them at all. It's funny. I, you know, I read the book a long time ago, and that's like the scene I remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I haven't even told very, you that. I was like, very intense. I thought it was the opening. You're like, no, it's not. And I'm like, oh, that was definitely. I think it's such a great, a great, um, entry into the world and you kind of get a good sense of what the book's about. So. Yeah, the, the Cuban character is not the best rep not the best <laughs> representative of us Cubans. He's a bad guy and he deserved it. Exactly. There's a lot of bad guys though in that yes, book. Yes, yeah. We got yeah, some bad Cubans in there too. No worries. We got some yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's, <laughs> such a, it's the kind of book you read in one sitting. It just, yeah. it really just moves. So. Yeah, and so it's it's an Amazon first read. Can you tell us what that means? Or 
Um, so I really don't even understand it myself. But, um, <laughs> Rachel will tell us in a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess, you know, they, they put it out there for all um, Amazon Prime readers and they can like download it um, in another uh, title for free um, just for this month. Um, so they, it's, cool. you know, open you got, to them. Wait, there's, there's two done. this month? Yeah, I think there's, you get two I didn't this know month. that. Yeah, you gotta go get yourself another one, girl. I'm about to because I, 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 I'm an Amazon Prime member, and like my favorite thing, besides, of course, the two day shipping, is that the Prime. I, I get excited. I'm like, oh, it's the first of the month. Time to pick my Prime. And I really take I'm like, which one should I do? Well, you're very, dis <laughs> very discerning reader. So now I didn't realize that there were two this month, though. So now I'm like, mm -hmm. I had to go back and get my second one. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. And indeed. so this and this book, uh, you won the Ellen, uh, Eleanor Taylor Bland Award, which. I, I'm biased. I was a judge, and I'm so excited to see this journey you're on. And I love this book. So, um, what was that like? What winning the award? Yeah, it was. It was so. It was surreal because honestly, I didn't think I had a chance. I mean, I sent that in, um, and I had heard about it, you know, in um, in our group, Prime Writers of Color, and mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, applied for it. I think even Kelly was like, you know, apply, and I was like you know and then i applied and didn't think i was gonna get it i even forgot about it and then i did and i was like yeah. oh, wow <laughs> well so, earned yeah it's a great book yeah thank and now you, it's now you. it's an actual it'll be out so it's officially out november 1st if you don't have prime you can pick it up november 1st mm -hmm. so yes yes Exciting. And we're what's having, your oh go ahead i'm sorry i think you and i are going to do a launch together for it right yes yeah. yes i'm excited about that we'll talk about it um i think uh, first week of November or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. get my questions together. So. Mm -hmm. And I get to talk book? to Rachel too next week, so that's really cool. Oh, nice. oh, I get nice. to talk to all my faves. Alex, yeah. you and I talking. No. Yeah, well, yeah. Let's do an event. Let's March. get it going. March. Yeah, March. in March. And that's my birthday month too. It's gonna be good. Oh, that means I need Alex's your book. Birthday. I'm March 15th. It, it's I'm coming March out on my 2nd. birthday. Oh, oh nice. Oh, yeah. see, that's nice. Look at you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, fingers crossed that no supply chain issues disrupt my birthday party. Are you, guys, are you guys Pisces? That's like the second coolest sign. Yeah. Yes. I would say it's the best, but. No, you're yeah. wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> I mean. <You're> so wrong. <laughs> what's your uh, book, uh, Reco? Your Reco? Um, is that Reco? <laughs> <laughs> so I um, just, well, first of all, I've kind of got two. I've got one that's coming up, which is the Midnight Hour with, um, you know, that's edited by um, Abby. Abby, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and has all these wonderful, uh, you know, writers in there. And I just am so excited for it because I'm like, oh, yeah, I just got a mix of everyone instead of like the one yeah. uh, long no novel I've been reading. So I'm really, really excited about that. That one. Um, I can tell you some of the people in it. It's actually, even though it's not a crime writers of color um, book, oh, it started members. through the group. Yeah. And so Abby Van Diver is the one who um, is the editor and it has mm -hmm. Jennifer Chow in it, Tracy Clark. It has H.C. Mm -hmm. Chan. It has Christopher Chambers, Richie Narvez, Frankie Bailey, someone named Ed Amar, Faye Snowden. What? Alex, Who's this? Ed I don't know who that is. Never heard of it. And many more. So it's, it's a really great group of people. So do you have another rec besides that one? Oh, um, and then I and I've just finished reading "Never Saw Me Coming" um, by Vera uh, Curry. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. I was trying to figure out how to pronounce her name. And That's that on my beautiful. list. Yes, and it's I think it's it's based in D.C. and I uh, D.C. Um, Maryland VA area is like close to my heart because that's where I'm from. So it's about psychopaths. <laughs> psychopaths in D.C. <laughs> And heard, murder, really murder by the book's doing an event for uh, Midnight Hour on the 9th of November. So oh, if you're yeah, excited about the anthology, one, yeah. yeah. But I heard Vera's book is really, really good. So yeah, it is. yeah, I want to read that. That one. So um, awesome. she's also a fellow debut, like you are, which is really cool. Yes, yes, but. it is. <laughs> Well, thanks for doing Thank this. It's well. always it's an honor having you on our in our lineup. So happy that yes. you're, you're your first your first reading. I I'm know. Honored. I'm like I'm with all like the all stars, and so I'm just fangirling over everyone. <laughs> you're an all star too. Like, oh, <laughs> Thank you, Alex. I appreciate yeah. you for saying that. <laughs> for sure. All right. Thank y'all. Thanks, y'all. All right. Bye, yes. All right. We've got. It's going to be hard to top all these readings, so no pressure to uh, <laughs> Naomi. <laughs> Naomi. Well, I, feel like, I feel like Naomi is like Naomi Harara is such a legend that I feel yeah, like she's that. a pro. person can follow. Yes, yeah, it's Naomi. Hi, Naomi. <sighs> oh, you're muted. She's talking. You got it? No. 
I think you're muted still. I was, I was saying. There you are. I was saying that I need Nina to come into the scene that I'll be reading. <laughs> Just to clean things up. Yeah, exactly. What are you going to be reading from? I'm going to be reading from Clark and Division, um, my historical book. novel that came out in August. And it's set, and Clark and Division is an intersection in Chicago, and um, it's set in 1944, Chicago. Awesome. Whenever you're ready. Okay. So this is a, a Japanese American family that's been released from Mansonar and they're in Chicago. And my, um, I'll be reading uh, from the middle and it's my main character, Aki Ito. And she's um, in looking to, for her uh, father's boss. The club itself was in a nondescript three-story brownstone building next to a pawn shop no sign outside identified the establishment. A big storefront window revealed men gathered around a large pool table. I took a deep breath and straightened my back. You can do this, Aki, I told myself. I knew that Pop's boss was a Nisei from Hawaii. I walked through the side door, my eyes adjusting to the darkness. It wouldn't hurt if Aloha turned on a few more lights. It smelled as nasty as it looked, like raw chicken that had been left out too long. A woman in a tight off-white dress revealing the outline of her chichis lounged in a chair beside a staircase that apparently led to a second floor. Looking for a job, honey? She practically purred. Playtime might be hiring. I frowned. Playtime was notorious for hiring both Hakujin and Nisei prostitutes for the GIs who frequented the place. I tried not to look at her chest. I'm here to see Rocky, I told her. Wait here. She teetered onto her high heels, almost losing her balance, and headed for another set of stairs that seemed to go down a basement. I noticed that a lot of unsavory-looking men were going down those steps. While she was fetching Pop's boss, I approached a small bar in the back that could only accommodate six stools. Seated on one of them was a Nisei man who had been in line behind me at the WR WRA office reading the same magazine. On the far left was the man I had been searching for all morning. Hammer wore the same mustard colored pants but was missing his jacket. The sweat stains were visible on the underarms of his white shirt. It looks like you haven't slept, I said, as I climbed onto the school stool next to him. Hammer didn't acknowledge me. He attempted to finish his drink, but the glass was empty. I wasn't sure if he was on drugs. He seemed completely different than when I had seen him on the streets of Clark and Division. No swagger or confidence. Stay away from me, Tropical. I'm no good. He banged his empty glass back onto the bar. I want to know why you were fighting with Roy. Hammer finally turned his head toward me. Didn't he tell you? There were scratch marks on his cheek that I hadn't noticed the night before. What happened to your face? Hammer fingered the scratches as if he were acquainting himself with his injury. My reminder did not sit well with him. Aki scram. This is no place for you. I cut to the chase. Rose was my sister. I deserve to know what you did to her. I didn't do anything that she didn't ask for. What does that mean? My voice sounded shrill and unfamiliar. The Nisei with the magazine narrowed his eyes as if my presence was disturbing him. I mean that Roy's the one who should be explaining himself, he said before clamming up. I felt like a nincompoop sitting at the bar in between two men who didn't seem to want anything to do with me. After a few minutes, Hammer broke his silence. You're lucky, you know. You have family. I don't know if you would call me lucky. Well, Rose had a sister who cares about her. She was lucky, too. I was now convinced that Hammer was on some kind of drug. This kind of philosophizing from him seemed totally out of character. A hefty man in a flowered shirt with a pencil behind his ear and cash in his hands came barreling up the basement stairs and headed straight to us. You asked for me? I'm Rocky. I jumped down from the stool and he gave me the once over. 
We only pay by the hour and you'll have to doll yourself up. Wear some heels. I'm not looking for a job. Rocky seemed relieved. I'm Gitaro Ito's daughter. Oh, Gid's kid. What happened to him? He's under the weather. From your rotten food, I didn't mention out loud. Oh, it's slow today anyway, but we'll need him tomorrow for sure. I nodded. His lack of compassion didn't surprise me. As far as I can tell, the aloha was all about business, both legal and not. Rocky went behind the bar and poured Hammer a fresh drink as I scurried to the door. The half-naked wo woman in the chair had left her post. I turned the corner and faced a large Hakujin man who blocked the exit. Hello, little geisha. I ignored him, looking down as I pressed forward. He didn't budge. It's too early for you to leave, he said, pushing me against the wall. He attempted to kiss me, but I dug my chin down. His cheek felt like sandpaper, and he reeked a beer. Let me go, I whispered. It was as if my voice were stepped in my, stepped in my chest. Find your voice, Aki, I told myself. But the more I tried, the more futile it was. The fleshy man kept me trapped in the dingy corner of Aloha's, delighting in my lack of audible response. I squirmed and turned back to the bar. Rocky was gone. Hammer was still hunched over his glass. The boy with the overgrown hair was still obsessed with his magazine. There was no one to save me. Taking a deep breath, I somehow was able to cross my arms over my chest and barrel forward into a crack of space between him and the door. Bursting out on, into the street, I knocked into the ample oshiri of the scantily clad woman who was now standing in front of the entrance, smoking a cigarette. Hey, watch it, she reprimanded. A line of cigarette ash fell and scattered onto the concrete. I didn't make any excuses or apologies. All I knew was that I had to get out of there. I practically ran down Clark Street, leaping over trash on the sidewalk and almost crashing into a group of people walking in the opposite direction. In the center of the foursome was a tall man in the dress we had seen the night before. His friends were also garishly outfitted in tight, low-cut gowns. They were all laughing, not bothering to notice my wretched state. On Clark Street, it was every person for herself. Get it. That was great. That's really great. There's some parallels in these stories I'm noticing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Families, yeah, things like that. So um, what, how'd you come up with the idea? Because one thing I love about you is you write so many different things. Um, you know, I also write nonfiction and I yeah. love history, but it's kind of weird. This is my first historical novel. Yeah. Um, but um, this one book um, I co-wrote with a friend called Life After Manzanar, and it was like exploring, you know, mm -hmm. after people's release, where did they go? What is Manzanar for those who don't know? Oh, okay. Manzanar is one of the 10 mass incarceration camps in the U.S. during World War II, and they held, uh, these 10 held a total of 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans, and two-thirds of them were actually born in America. Mm -hmm. They use these weird terms, you know, like aliens and non-aliens. Like, what the hell is a non-alien? So, um, yeah, so this topic, um, you know, I worked at a Japanese American newspaper, so I was very close to it. And I've worked on a lot of exhibitions related to it, too. But I never really thought about writing a novel about it until um, I came across a, a report that said, all these different crimes that had been occurring in Chicago among among the young people, you know that that was the number one destination for people, uh, the people who had been held. They lived there temporarily, so it, it ballooned from four hundred to twenty thousand people, and you get wow. get a bunch of young people, you know, that were confined. Of course, yeah. what are you going to do? You're going to get in trouble. You want to party, you want to have you know get together with people, you know. So and and so I just thought this um, story would humanize Japanese Americans. Like we're not quite the model minority. We're not robots. We're people that hurt and act out and get mad and you know do bad things sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it must have helped to have done all that research and been been able to pull from it and fictionalize it. Yeah, and it helped that I went there and I had mm -hmm. friends that 
took me around because I'm an LA person. Yeah, I was uh, thinking that. So yeah. that was scary. But I just feel, you know, with every book, you have to do something that's slightly scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to push to me, yourself. To me, writing is scary. So I do. <laughs> yeah, true, true. <laughs> and you have another book coming in March, right? Yeah. And that's um, the Leilani. That's totally kind of different. It's called the. In, uh, an eternal lay. It's the second Leilani Santiago book. And it's actually, you actually, it says it takes place during the pandemic, it's right? Taking wow. place in, because I don't like to do anything simple. Yeah. <laughs> Tw yeah. October 2020 is when it's set. So I think there's something in me, unfortunately. I mean, I'm, I'm damaged, you know, there's something about trauma that I deeply understand so it, I'm just attracted to it. It's like, let's go right to the middle of it. And yeah, get to the heart of it. Are you yeah, wearing a cat exactly. shirt? I have to ask for the audience. Someone Nicole, in the audience. It's the welcoming cat. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, did you have any recommendations for us? Your reco. Call no, yeah, your reco. You know, book reco. I was reco. going to um, oh, that's the other <laughs> recommend this book, but yeah, then there's somebody named Alex Agura that's part of it so i don't know i should rescind it but oh yeah he's, um, he's, prob he's problematic there's some wonderful actually members of our group that are mm -hmm. featured in this and alifair burke who was a guest a editor member. and my girl steph cha is the editor of the whole series so and the other one is um tori eldridge's um the ninja betrayed which is set That's in hong one. kong i really love her series and she, she writes a lot time. about food, which I love too. Yes, I'm very <laughs> pro food. Yeah. Um, she she read last time, so if you want to rewatch the last one, you can hear yeah. Tori had did a great reading. Well, it's always great to see you. Thanks for yeah. joining our little party. Everyone in person, but yeah, it, this is wonderful. It'll be Thank next you. year at Left Coast Crime. Yes, I will be the there. Awesome. Yeah, I'll be there as well. I'll be there. All right. Thanks, Naomi. Bye, Bye, Naomi. All right. Next up, we have. Uh, the amazing Rachel Housel Hall. Hello. Hey. Hey. Hi. How's it going? I'm like constantly in learning mode, listening to all my incredibly talented um, colleagues here. So, where are you? Because this is not your normal setup. I know your setup. Yeah, I'm at. This is my day office. Oh, oh it's a day I, office and I a just night said, office. Fuck it. I don't feel like moving. <laughs> oh. That's a spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've reached that point of the pandemic. Yeah. This is also, this is yeah. also my day office, also it's my like, night office. No, no more like nice little books and all that. I'm like, yeah, y'all. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm proud of myself for just setting my book yes. up behind me. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's all. Um, are you going to read from your new one? Yes, I am. These toxic things. It's so good. Thank you. It Thank is. You. Um, I'm going to actually read a new part. I um, One of my favorite things about this book, it's about a digital scrapbooker, a 24-year-old who um, is curating digitally the memories of clients. And it's like a kind of Alexa device. But more than the tech, what I love about this book is the relationship that she has with her, her parents. Um, and I, I've said before, but this is like the first book where I, a 51-year-old woman, my experience is not centered in this. And I am one of the parents. And I usually read the mom in, in Mickey, but I'm going to read the dad in Mickey today. Nice. So I'm going to read that. All Yay. right. Okay. Rotting crab apples litter the grassy walkway that leads to my apartment above the garage, which she lives behind her parents. It's a smaller version of my parents' Spanish style, offering more white stucco and brown wood frames. One bedroom, but I don't need more than that. Moving boxes and shopping bags crowd the carpet. Some are still taped shut in case Chris, her ex-boyfriend, calls to say that he misses me and wants me to move back because she was living in sin. I thought, no, I, I thought today's call was that call. Since I was wrong, I will unpack another box. Guess that's my equivalent of pouring one out for things that no longer are. Sometimes I empty more than one box, usually when I'm looking for a skirt, or a pair of shoes among the flotsam and jetsam of my shattered love affair. Shattered love affair. Sounds far more dramatic than how we ended. I open my front door and like the security and like the security system in the main house, the sensor alerts and says front door. The system doesn't beep, beep, beep though, since I didn't arm it before leaving this morning. I flip the light switch to illuminate the staircase that leads up to my living room, but my eyes are drawn to the foyer's tile floor. 
Someone slipped a piece of grimy yellow folded paper through the gap between the door and the threshold. Huh. I plucked it from the ground and opened the note. You're so pretty. Dad may sometimes have issues with your Y-O-U-R and your Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, but this is not his handwriting, narrow, left slanted. It's not his. Did the gardener leave this earlier and I just noticed it? Possibly. Maybe our mailman? I notice that my hands are shaking. I'm being watched without the pleasure of knowing who's watching me. In college, a stalker left more notes on my car. After two weeks, he turned his attention to another girl. After she rebuffed him, he attacked her in the parking structure on campus. A hum and a rumble make my pulse jump. I look up from the note. The thermostat and water heater. I'm used to them by now. I'm also used to the loose window screen in my bedroom rattling at this moment. But there's a new noise tonight. Barely there scratching in the walls, on the roof, in my head. On the bottom of the note, I scribble the date and time I found this message in my foyer, then slip it into my sketch pad, just in case. I'll tell mom and dad and we'll either fire the gardener or file a complaint with the postmaster. I will not be terrorized in my own house. After showering, I pull on dad's USC sweatshirt and a pair of his unworn boxer shorts. I pull my hair out of the ponytail holder and the tension on my scalp ebbs. Heart heavy, I wander to the living room television stand. There sits my own memory bank, dust collecting on its screen. I haven't asked for a memory in weeks. I click on the floor lamp. Memory bank, tell me about the road trip to Santa Barbara. The screen brightens with a selfie of Christopher and me standing on the, on the pier. Willow, the narrator, Willow's smoky voice fills the room. It was a clear sky day as you and Chris drove up the coast. Your first stop was the pier. The small projector atop the bank glows and soon that selfie hovers in the air. Bobby Caldwell's What You Won't Do For Love plays because that afternoon, the Yacht Rock station spun that disc three times in two hours. A new projection replaces the selfie, a giant ice tower of shrimp, oysters, and crab legs. You drank Bloody Marys and ate your weight in seafood. From Caldwell to the caw of seagulls and the clunk of far off buoys. Another selfie, Christopher kissing my cheek. It was your first getaway together. A last photograph of the setting sun with Christopher st standing in shadow, looking out to the Pacific Ocean, the roar of waves crashing against the shore. That night, he told you that he had fallen in love with you. Christopher broke up with me a week after we successfully tested Road Trip, which is an app, a part of her memory bank. Downstairs, someone knocks on the door. I run down and squint through the peephole. It's dad. You're crying. He follows me up the stairs. His eyebrows crumple as he spots the projection of Christopher. What's wrong? I swipe at my cheeks and then swipe at the sensors to close the projection. Allergies? He points at his sweatshirt. I've been looking for that. I turn on the floor lamp, then pull a ceramic smoking frog from the box. The amphibian wears a taco-shaped hat with Mexico painted along its brim, and this tacky memento is now a hologram in my bank as the first gift Chris gave me. Oh, Dad says, smiling. He's cute. Yeah, I decided to unpack the we're in love, let's go on a field trip souvenir box. There's a hot pink leather bag from Miami shaped like a bikini top and a hella misspelled what happens in Vegas stays in vegan bumper sticker. Dad nudges another box with the toe of his sneaker. Need help? I got it, thanks. I cock my judgy eyebrow. Didn't look like you and mom were discussing a vacation. They were kind of arguing. We were discussing the pros and cons of a cruise and buying travel insurance. Is something wrong? Is there a reason why we sh wouldn't go? We? You're going to join us? Sure. Is this trip anytime soon or is it our birthday gift? Dad points to his chest. It's my birthday gift to your mother. I pick out a thumbnail. I have something planned, just so you know. Yeah, what? He plops onto the couch. I grab a stuffed manatee from the box and fling it across the room. Secret, can't say. Dad grabs an aquarium snow globe and shakes it. Don't want to get her the same thing. That won't happen. I pull out a pyramid-shaped flashlight from Las Vegas. Want this? Keep it. That's your memory. I shake my head, thrust it at him with my eyes averted. Soon the weight of the light leaves my hand. Dad clicks on the flashlight. Your mom wants to go during Thanksgiving break. 
Sasha's wedding is next week, Thanksgiving Day, remember? Dad remembers, and mom sure as hell remembers. She just doesn't care. She's gone on and on about how crazy it is to make people attend an out-of-town wedding on Thanksgiving. Not that her rants matter, dad says, reading my mind. I can't go on a long vacation right now anyway. An accountant's work is crazy at the end of the year. I grin, hooray, since I'm not at the firm anymore, I don't have to care about calendar year versus fiscal year. They're still trying to fill your spot. Everybody misses you. I miss you. I make a show of pulling out a pink feather boa that I purchased after Elton John's Vegas concert. I love my new job. Chris doesn't change that. I do miss hanging out with you. I don't miss writing about charity drives, corporate compliance training and staff changes and being micromanaged by Phoebe. Oh my God, I can't stand that woman. It's a newsletter, Phoebe. Not fucking Vanity Fair, calm down. I fling my head back and pose with the boa. Dad throws a couch cushion at me. I guess newsletters are dull compared to everything else. The math nerds worship me. I like that a lot. I blow at a loose pink feather to keep it in the air. Dad watches me blow at that feather, then rests his hand on my shoulder. Time to eat. Maybe play some happy memories on that gizmo over there. I find the Vegas branded magic eight ball in the box. I'll take mom's skirt to the cleaners tomorrow because she messed it up. And I'll be fine, father. Right, magic eight ball? I shake the toy and read the prediction. Outlook not so good. Oh, my chest tightens at, as dad pulls himself from the couch. I'm hearing scratches, I tell him, like either in the walls or on the roof. We live an inch away from an urban forest. You want mice building a castle in the eaves? Also, can you do something about the window screen frame in my bedroom? The racket is keeping me from my beauty sleep. He holds up both hands. Okay, I'll check and make sure no one's built another encampment back there. And I'll make sure no mouse droppings are near the vents. And I'll fix the screen. Anything else, Mrs. Hemsley? Ha, you wanted me to move back. His head drops and he fake frowns. Yeah, what the hell was I thinking? Dad, he winks at me. Come down to dinner. You've pissed off your mother enough tonight and I can't protect you again. He plods down the stairs. After he leaves, I sink against the couch as my nerves pop against my skin. Crap, forgot to show him the strange note. The scratching starts again. I freeze as goosebumps march across my arms and back. Fury is scratching like he's digging for his life, like something is chasing. I shout, stop it, stupid mouse. That scratching is joined by a metallic nick, 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 the loose screen. There's a loud pop. Something just snapped in the wind, a branch, a wire. I swallow against my heart rising in my throat. A city girl freaking out over mice, window screens, scraping branches and wind. True danger is not an inch away. The scratching stops. The boogeyman must have caught that mouse and gobbled him up. I pop down the stairs to make sure the door is locked. I nudge the security chain into its slide, but something I see makes me stop in my step. Another sheet of folded paper on the tile floor. Like the earlier note, this paper is also yellow and just as grimy, narrow left slanted handwriting sits in the center of the sheet. You look like her. That's it. That's awesome. I am. Um, I was Good listening work. to this on audiobook driving up to Connecticut when I this scene came up and I started like screaming. I was like, oh no, no! <laughs> I know oh, it's spelling. How's the narrator? <laughs> she's really good. She's like, she's good. Need or something. Yeah. yeah she's, um, she's great. Um, just a little uh, galley brag over here. Whatever. I didn't get anything, but it's okay. <laughs> Rachel. Rachel, how's oh, I feel very busy. special. You are busy. I'm trying is to. That what it is? is that yeah, what it that's is? Is that what it is? Yeah, that's what it is. You know that. Um, what I love about Mickey is that she. Um, like a lot of times like someone will get like stalked and they don't tell anybody and it annoys the hell out of me in the book and she's like i'll tell my dad right now <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> like, i'm calling the police right now my uncle is yes. coming over right now like, so I'm like <laughs> i appreciate that she's like i'm telling people she feels very um i think All i didn't call her millennial like like very millennial gen z like yeah very assertive which i really appreciate about the character. yes I, I i love her and yeah she is she's she's very close with with her parents yeah. and like i said um She's inspired by my daughter and my oldest niece, and Maya is my heart. 
and we talk about, you know, basically everything. And I could see her living in our house and, you know, having that kind of communication. And her That's what I thought when I read it. I was yeah. like, this seems like Maya or Rachel. Who oh, you've met and you've hung yeah. out with. Yes. So long ago. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, how's it been? You know, it's it launched not too long ago. So it's been a huge yes. Yes. Yeah. Like billboards in Times Square. Little things. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> no, it's been in, it's been incredible. Um like like Gaspin, I was an Amazon first read, and that introduced me to so many wonderful readers, um, and and you know got the story out there, and I you know I'm excited about these these books, Gaspin's books, all of our stuff. It's it's I had an event with um, Attica on Tuesday night, and we were just saying how back you know just five years ago there were only like four of us or something. And now, like you said, there are over 300 people in Crime Matters of Color. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And that publishers are interested in our stories. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate one thing about Amazon, Thomas and Mercer. They really are like just buying so many great books by people of color. Yes. And know. they just bought two more for me um, from me just a week or so ago. So I'm that's looking great. forward to telling a Catalina Island story. Catalina Island, if those who don't know, is... Um, one of several channel islands off the coast of California. And it's Los Angeles's getaway, but they're like literally two black people living full time on the island. So it is ripe for some um, Rachel Housel Hall shenanigans and commentary. Yeah. I so, cannot wait. wait. I better get a co- I better get a copy of that one. You will. And you can Maybe. get a copy of We Lie Here too. I will I will I will send that to you. I'm gonna get pity send, but it's I'll take it. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'll take the pity send. Embrace the pity send. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's your reco? Yeah, what's your reco? <laughs> I have two I'm reading right now. The first is Joe Ide's new non um, IQ series it's of good. Marvel novel. It's good the Bit yeah, by Coast. I'm reading this right now. Okay. And our own Robert Justice. Yes. I can't take your name. Yeah, I just well, read that. Was that. Other, that was my other. That was my suggestion too. I, have it. I think next month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I'm loving both. I'm I'm glad that I like have two. This is remarkable, yeah. right? Yeah, you're so yeah. well prepared. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, so <laughs> Robert's book comes out in December, and it's really cool. It's about um, a guy who's on death row for a crime he didn't commit. And obviously yes. there's 30 days until he's about to um, be executed and his daughter's trying to get him, um, his, his, spare his life. So it's it, really cool. It's, it's, very it's really life. evocative. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Denver yeah. story. And I was just in Denver and I don't see how people can like breathe and do things in Denver. I was like constantly breath. Oh, Cause it's breath- so high up. Yeah, it's so and high ashy. Up. And ashy. Oh, I, know. I, I know it's no ashy. You don't like ashy. Black people, people don't like on. ashy. Oh, I hated it. I mean, I loved being there, yeah. but you know, it 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 hurt in some ways. So I'm very happy that Robert is telling a story about Black people in Denver. So yeah, no, he really did a great job. Uh, yeah. It's it's a good book. Well, Rachel, thanks for coming and joining our little party. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Hi, Rachel. All right. Well, we're at the grand finale with our last reader, uh, Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Hello. Hi, hi, Sylvia. I've never met her in real life. I just on Twitter, the Twitter. Hi, Sylvia. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Same here. I just recognize people by their Twitter icons. I don't. It's I know. So where's the little see, duck? It's, it's <laughs> funny to see who looks like their picture and who does not. <laughs> yeah, I do look like <laughs> well, thanks for doing this. We're excited to have you as part of the lineup. And uh, we, we just did an event uh, for Murder by the Book not long ago for Velvet Was the Night, which is fantastic. So. Are you going to be reading from the new one or? Yes, I'm going to be reading from Velvet Was the Night. So, awesome. uh, Velvet Was the Night is my latest and it's a noir. It's set in 1970s Mexico against a background of political unrest. And we open with the first chapter here with a moment in time, which really happened, in which paramilitary groups trained by the Mexican government were attacking activists and killing them, repressing them, torturing them, all that kind of stuff. Our point of view character is Elvis, who is one of these paramilitary people, and he is heading over to work at the protest uh, where students are gathering. Awesome. June 10, 1971. He didn't like beating people. Elvis realized this was ironic considering his line of work. 
Imagine that, a thug who wanted to hold his punches. Then again, life is full of such ironies. Consider Richie Balance, who was afraid of flying and died the first time he set foot on an airplane. Damn shame that. And the other dude who died, Buddy Holly and the big bopper Richardson, they weren't half bad either. Or there was that playwright, Aeschylus. He was afraid of being killed inside his house, and then he steps outside and wham, an eagle tosses a tortoise at him, cracking his head open. Murdered right there in the most stupid way possible. Often life doesn't make sense, and if Elvis had a motto, it was that. Life's a mess. That's probably why he loved music and factoids. They helped him construct a more organized world. When he wasn't listening to his records, he was poring over the dictionary, trying to memorize a new word or plowing through one of those almanacs full of stats. No, sir. Elvis wasn't like some of the perverts he worked with who got excited smashing a dude's kidneys. He would have been happy solving crosswords and sipping coffee like their boss, El Mago. And maybe one day he would be an accomplished man of that sort. But for now, there was work to be done. And this time, Elvis was actually eager to beat a few motherfuckers up. He hadn't developed a sudden taste for blood and cracking bones, no. But El Güero had been at him again. El Güero was a policeman before he joined up with Elvis's group. And that made him cocky, made him want to throw his weight around. In practice, being a poly meant shit because El Mago was the egalitarian sort who didn't care where his recruits came from. Ex-cops, ex-military, borros, and juvenile delinquents were welcome as long as they worked right. But the thing was, El Güero was 25, getting long in the tooth, and that was making him anxious. Soon enough, he'd have to move on. The chief requirement of a hawk was he needed to look like a student so he could inform on the activities of the annoying reds infesting the universities. Toscos, Maui's, Spartacos. There were so many flavors of dissidents, Elvis could barely keep track of all their organizations. And if necessary, fuck up a few of them. Sure, there were important fossils, like El Fish, who was 27. But El Fish had been in one political shenanigan or another since he was a wee first year chemistry student. He was as professional as Boros got. El Güero hadn't achieved nearly as much. Elvis had just turned 21, and El Güero felt the weight of his age and eyed the younger man with distrust, suspecting El Mago was going to pick El Elvis for a plum position. Lately, El Güero had been making snide remarks about how Elvis was a marshmallow, how he never went on any of the heavy assignments, and instead he was picking locks and taking pictures. Elvis did what El Mago asked, and if El Mago wanted him to pick the locks and snap photos, who was Elvis to protest? But that didn't sway El Güero, who had taken to impunging Elvis' masculinity in veiled and irritating ways. A man who spends so much time running a comb through his hair isn't a man at all, El Güero would say. The real Elvis Presley is a hip, shaking, girly man. What are you getting at? Elvis asked, and El Güero smiled. What are you saying about me now? <laughs> didn't mean you, of course. Who do you mean then? Presley, like I said, the fucking weirdo you like so much. Presley's the king. Ain't nothing wrong in liking him. Yankee garbage, El Güero said smugly. So that's it. That's the first couple of pages. That was really good. That was fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, where did you get the idea from? Oh, um, I knew about this time period and what was going on. It's a decade called the Dirty War when the police, um, when the government is repressing activists and left-wing um, people. Um, my mother was at the place where this happened, where the hawk strike happened. So she heard the guns and, and hate and all that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. Um, and so it was just this uh, time period in Mexico when the ruling party was sort of losing control of, of the people. People wanted freedom and democracy and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, the government didn't want to give them that. So did you talk to your mom, like interview her for research? Uh, she was quite young, so she didn't know much about the politics, but I did a lot of archival research. So I have a lot of pictures of newspapers of the time period. Um, oh, I have this fun one, which is, uh, it says foreign terrorists. So there was a lot of this information 
uh, about what was happening. The government accused the students of attacking people. So they said they brought guns, they brought all that stuff. That's not true. Um, the archives of what happened were released about, I think, maybe five years ago. And there we saw that the government obviously had been funding um, all these groups to attack activists. And the CIA had been involved, had been involved because they had helped train these cells of anti-activist groups. They didn't want communism to take root in Mexico and in many parts of Latin America. And one way to do that was to create shock groups that would um, work for them and uh, kind of keep leftists down. Wow. Yeah, it's really the way you weave it into the narrative. It doesn't. It never feels like you're getting a history lesson. It's just part of kind of the the uh, the story itself, which it just it's really really well done. Um, and you know, you hop around genre wise, which is impressive. Do, what 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 pushes you? Like, is it just based on the idea, whatever the whatever mood strikes you in terms of your next project, or? Yeah, pretty much. I get bored with something, and then I want to do something completely different kind of to wash the taste of the previous thing. And in this case, I had done something else. And so I was kind of washing the taste. Um, I also got really bored of science fiction and fantasy and horror for a while. I got really desperate and I never wanted to write anything in that genre again. So I decided <laughs> to do something. Came different. over here. Yeah. <laughs> and it was good because I actually wrote again science fiction and fantasy. My next novel is uh, called The Island of Dr. Moreau and is out next year. So I'm back to um, specular fiction, but that was after a kind of a gap where I didn't care about it anymore. And I said, I hate it. I hate it's everybody. A, you have to kind of fall in love with it again. To write crime. <laughs> but you're not sick of us, right? You're not sick of crime. No, no. Okay, you're going to okay. keep hanging out here. Okay, good. You're all very um, nice. You're all very nice. You're not devils. Yeah, it's a great group. And <laughs> your, your posts in the group are so informative. Um, yeah. So, okay, Kelly's making fun of my word every time. So what are your <laughs> book recos? What's <laughs> your Yeah, I am reading All That Is Secret by Patricia Rayvon right now. Oh, good. And that was one of my... Yeah. yeah, it's a 1920s. I guess, m murder mystery. And I'm very bad at salt knowing who killed anybody. I always think it was the butler in the, <laughs> you know, the candlestick. And like, that's my level of, of solving mystery. So I like anybody that does that. And, and this is that kind of thing. It's, it's a young woman during the jazz age who is trying to figure out what happened to her dad. So yeah, I like that. Awesome. It's currently out now. I have my, my notes about it. Um, and it's great because she's, she's a theologi theologian. How do you say that? Theologian. Yeah. Theologian. So, and so it's just really, it sounds like it's really cool. So I'm glad you're enjoying it. So. Yeah, yeah, thanks so I much. Like um, interesting jobs in other time periods. And this oh, yeah, I love it. One that I hadn't heard before. So Yeah. <laughs> really, really cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for being a part of this. We were so yes, happy when so you said yes. Oh, yeah. No, thank you, guys. It's great. Awesome. What a lineup, huh? That was a great, a great evening. Hopefully, everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, I, um, I kind of forgot I was hosting. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And it's funny. There's the the private chat is very lit, so hopefully the other chats were lit too. A lot of astrological <laughs> talk <laughs> about how Libras are the best because no, no one else. No, I think anything. it's about it's about the success of Pisces. No, Libras are the best. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Well, Alex, thank you for letting me join you again. Of course. Yeah, this is always fun. And uh, was there anyone else you wanted to plug? Or I feel like everyone stole everyone our name. Kinda, yeah. yeah, they plugged all the people that I listed. Everyone is here, you know. We had some really great people. And so I can't wait for the next event. You know, hopefully we're going to try different different genres. So we have cozies. We have some suspense. We have a bunch of different things that we can do next time. So, Yeah, thanks to yeah. McKenna and John at Murder yeah. by the Book for having us. Hi, there you are. Hi, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to make sure you didn't have any more recommendations so I could put them in the uh, comments. But it sounds like everything got covered. We're going to be doing this, what, every two months, right? Yeah. That's what John said, yeah. So yeah, we're exciting. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So um, we'll get all that lined up and um, start promoting for next time. Thank you, guys. I have to say just you two do the best job like <laughs> it's, it's like we're friends in real life i just <laughs> like yeah we do <laughs> but yes it's because you're friends you know the people and you're engaging and um delightful so i enjoy oh, sitting thanks. back and listening 
as have uh, the audience. And yes, the comments are lit as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, while we were promoting Pisces, I agree with Alex. Same sign for me. Thank um, you. They were talking <laughs> about books and how much they've loved books by various authors who were reading tonight. So, anyway, when's your birthday, um, McKenna? March twelfth. All right, we've oh. talked. I'm, I'm the fifteenth. So we can. Yeah. We need to do a murder by the book birthday celebration. We should. Um, yeah, secret <laughs> identity comes it's up. It's not planned already. <laughs> it is now. We're doing it. Exactly. <laughs> Even though uh, I don't, I, I, I'll still come. Don't worry, guys. You can be an honorary Pisces. <laughs> I don't know. Let's not go that far. Let's you can be that. deputized <laughs> as a fish. Let's not go that far. <laughs> we can just invite you. How's Thank that? You, you, don't, you don't have to advocate for our sign. It's Thank okay. You. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Well, I'm gonna um send us all off. We have the authors in the studio. Thanks to everyone who came tonight yes. all the authors as well you did a wonderful job amazing um, readers yes. yeah absolutely and thanks to everyone who watched and um and also gg pondian did the graphics and also Manju no. did the graphics so thanks to them too yes so. big thanks absolutely. absolutely okay i'm gonna hit end broadcast it's been a delight as always and thanks I'll everybody bye guys